it's a space adaptation syndrome. That's, that's the yes, name. Right. Yeah. And uh, there's a fair amount of cooperation, I gather, between all nations because, it, well, it's, it's a problem everybody's faced. And um, the Soviets have had problems yeah. with it, too. I presume there's a fair exchange between all of the nations on, you know, what the problem is and what the solution might be. Well, we we're hoping you to, to get to the bottom of it, and uh, some of the data that we will be taking on this flight with uh, Dr. Thagard being there uh, will helpfully, hopefully uh, help us to solve some of that problem. But uh, I think it's uh, uh, highly overrated as a problem. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> we're, uh, we're going to get some uh, more shortly. The uh, latest date is everything's proceeding smoothly. We should uh, uh, hear about orbit. Uh, when, when is orbit going to be achieved? Pretty soon. Be in about 30 minutes. 30 minutes. We will be back to uh, follow the proceedings with the seventh mission of the shuttle in just a moment. We're going to take this break first. Every day later the day will be the launch of a commercial satellite, the Telesat for Canada. So we will see uh, Roy Bridges, we're currently operating there, being replaced by John McBride. He's the fellow, Bridges is the fellow with uh, just to the right there of the photographer in center picture here at the Johnson Space Center. They are now in touch with all of the worldwide tracking stations, everything going well. Next big order of business for us will be to watch the payload bay doors open on live television in about an hour. Jane? And thank you, Roy Neal from Mission Control in Houston. Bob? Well, I wanted to ask you, you had mentioned that you had been on four, you've seen four, four launches, but what you didn't say is that you saw one of them in one of those T-38 planes with Sally Ride Sally, in the back yes, seat. Tell correct. us what that was like when you were well, flying around uh, watching the thing go up. Sally around. and I had the, the chase assignment for return, one of the chase assignments for return to launch site for the first launch. So we saw the first launch STS-1 fly off the pad from about 18,000 feet and about seven miles south of the pad. And it's a very interesting view. And besides Sally being a super person, she's also a good pilot and a good mission specialist. She does everything well. And she did a super job as, as my backseater in the chase, chase mission. But I, watching it from a chase airplane and watching it from the ground, I still prefer watching it from the ground because it stimulates more of your senses when you're standing on the ground and feeling the earth shake and the <laughs> air crack and things like that. It's a beautiful view from up in an airplane, but the senses are, are stimulated a whole lot more on the ground when you do it. Right. We're in the right place. So stay <laughs> with us. We'll be back after the message. I'm going to go ahead and maneuver to attitude. Roger. Achieve orbit in about 30 minutes or so. Um, and uh, thereafter, one of the first events that we will see, we will actually be seeing and transmitting live, the, uh, the actual opening of the payload bay doors. Why do they do that so soon? The uh, inside of the uh, payload bay doors has some radiators mounted on them. And, uh, of course, these radiators are required to reject the heat generated in the spacecraft and to uh, keep it cool. Up till uh, that point in time, water is used with an evaporator, and uh, water is limited in supply, and so it's necessary to get the doors open to have access to these radiators. Uh, by the way, in case uh, you slept in and missed the launch, it's, uh, it's gone off. It's uh, proceeded as we speak perfectly. But we're going to have a replay again of uh, the, uh, as always, spectacular Minus launch nine, as it occurred exactly 7.33 this morning seven, Eastern Time. Six. We go for main engine start. We have main engine start and ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of STS-7 and America's first woman astronaut. And the shuttle has cleared the tower. Roger your roll, Challenger. Houston now controlling mission control confirms roll maneuver starting. Ground time on OS channel 217 Twenty seconds. Rust looks good. Twenty-five seconds. Roll maneuver completed. Uh, Jeff, what's the sensation? We we know from the earlier space missions, you know, earlier twenty years ago, that there was a real problem that or to the extent that there was a serious discomfort as people were forced back into their chairs. We saw distended faces and photographs like that. That's not true anymore, is it, with no, this? No, really, that never was true in the space program. The maximum G-loading we ever got up to was about four Gs maximum. Uh, you saw those kinds of pictures on people who uh, rode the rocket sleds and so forth and did some of the early testing on, on the influences of uh, G-forces on the body. So you were sort of going to what's, what engineers call the test of destruction, practically. <laughs> on that, That's right. On this, the uh, maximum acceleration is 3 G's, uh, which is attained uh, just shortly before uh, main engine cutoff. And uh, the uh, Big Bird lights off. Uh, there is a 
kind of a thump in the back, and uh, the G-force is not very large, however. It uh, builds up to about two Gs at the uh, separation of the solid rockets, lets up a little bit, and then it builds up again to three Gs, and this is where you feel a, just a relentless, powerful, aggressive, forceful push into orbit. Uh, what would that be the, like? Uh, being in a sports car with a rapid acceleration, or I mean, can you can you compare it to something that uh, we would understand? That's right, right. Uh, perhaps on a runaway sports car. Okay, um, uh, which is which is uh, exhilarating and by no means unpleasant. Then, not at all. Okay, uh, we will continue our uh, live coverage of the seventh mission of the shuttle, and we'll have another report at eight o'clock uh, with Rick Hull in Atlanta. Meantime, back to Atlanta.